you. Welcome everyone. I'm Indu Aurora and I'm a board member at Emerge Guelph Sustainability and welcome to Emerge Women's EV Night. And we would like to recognize our sponsors tonight for this evening, Plug and Drive and Barry Cullen Chevrolet. Before we begin our programming, I would like to begin with our land acknowledgement. Of course, this is particular to Guelph, but we also recognize that we have speakers and attendees joining us from across Canada and into the United States. As we gather, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. As a community, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. Today we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations of the Anishinaabe peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting. From a housekeeping perspective, I want to point out that we will have an opportunity to take questions later. We ask that you use the chat button that should be visible at the bottom of your screens. Your questions will be aggregated and then sent to me directly by one of our staff. I will ask that all of our participants this evening to be careful about using acronyms that all of us might not be familiar with. I'll attempt to stay on top of them about this, but let us know in the chat if there is anything that you aren't familiar with. Thank you again for joining us. This event is part of our work to help normalize the idea of EVs. We know that EV ownership is dominated by men. This webinar is for women by women. This is meant to be an icebreaker for those of you, how should we put it, are EV curious perhaps. I'm curious and I have my own questions that I'd like answered tonight as well. And my daughter who's 11 and on this um, webinar tonight, she's she is expecting me to have answers to those questions as she's been pushing us to get an EV. We want this to be an informal and fun evening. Get comfortable in your chair and let's meet our first guest tonight. I'd like to share our agenda for the evening quickly with you. So we had the welcome and we're going to have Rasha Abusida the Sustainability and Program Coordinator from Emerge. She's going to be speaking about Emerge and climate change. Then we will have an EV overview by, sorry, um, Kara Clareman, President and CEO of Plug and Drive and Dav Savitkovich, Chief Operating Officer of Plug and Drive. And next slide, sorry. Then we will have the comfy chair chat um, which will involve Kara, Dav, and Shirley Hunt and Lisa McTaggart, who are EV ambassadors, followed by the closing comments. So our first speaker tonight is Rasha Abusita. She's the Sustainability Coordinator at Emerge. She is responsible for our home tune-up program and has also been the co-organizer of our programming that has brought together over 20,000 people to our EV events. Rasha will kick us off tonight with a discussion on eMERGE and climate change. Rasha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Indu. Hi, everyone. I would like to make it as much brief as possible. eMERGE fights climate change through many ways by working towards achieving 100% renewable energy in Guelph. And you are helping us to flatten the climate change curve. Guess what? In the water conservation piece, we have reduced the equivalent water use of 176 homes per year. And this number keeps increasing every time. Is it good enough? From hydro savings, we have also reduced the equivalent hydro use of 160 homes per year. And this number keeps increasing every time. Is it good enough? From natural gas savings, we have also reduced the equivalent natural gas use of 176 homes. Uh, sorry, I have to admit, 176 homes uh, per year, and this number keeps moving. 
and increasing. Is it good enough? Also, for, uh, for, for the residential CO2 reduction, we have also reduced or removed 195 cars from the road. Is it good enough? From the electric vehicles piece, our friends from Plug and Drive has set a new goal to reach 5% of new car sales by 2020. So is this good enough? Guess what? In wealth, we have already exceeded this target. We have achieved 7.6% of EV sales in 2018, which is two years before Plug and Drive reached their target. And here we are, uh, and here the city has two specific targets uh, to fight climate change. First, to move towards 100% renewable energy, and this is only for the corporation of the city of Guelph, uh, not the broader community, and also to move towards net zero carbon in 2050 for the city wide. And we would like to be aggressive here and say that 2050 is far too late, and also net zero carbon is not good enough. Our proposal is instead to go towards 100% renewable energy for the citywide and the date must be much sooner. But before in order to reach to this target, we need to remember two things here. First, 100% renewable energy doesn't mean to stick your solar panels or wind turbine on an SUV. No, not at all. For a very good reason is that two thirds of the energy is wasted in Canada. So we have to tackle this energy waste piece first in order to move towards more efficient technologies and to reach to our target, which is 100% renewable energy in Guelph faster and smoother. So the question here is why is Emerge pushing electric vehicles? Well, actually, this is a very essential tool for us to fight climate change when we em uh, embrace uh, active transportation here and we give the highest priority to walking, followed by cycling and electric bikes, followed by electrified trans uh, public transit and then electric vehicles. We believe that internal combustion engines have no place in this century. And the quicker we can take them off the road is the better for environmental reasons. Now, implementing transportation plans will take time and needs much effort to be done properly. So while the, ex uh, while the planning is ongoing, we need to accelerate the switch to electric vehicles. And guess what? In Guelph, we have over 8,100 new vehicle sales every year. So if we convince the buyers to move towards electric vehicles, we can get immediate results and substantial. Every purchase will help us to cut four tons of CO2 or carbon every year. And every electric vehicle will be easier and much quicker CO2 savings compared to household energy. But we also need to do both along with other ways to fight climate change. And with this, I will end my discussion with this piece that we are here today to celebrate our success that we reached our target in 2018 to reach EV sales of 7.6% uh, with our friends from Plug and Drive. Thank you for the, your support, Plug and Drive, and uh, thank you for listening. Back to you, Endo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasha. Our next speakers come to us from our good friends at Plug and Drive. Their accomplishments in promoting EV use throughout Ontario have been nothing short of spectacular. Their not-for-profit plug and drive has one of the most comprehensive collections of EVs anywhere in the country, and they have the expertise to go with it. Emerge is so proud to bring you Kara Clareman, CEO of Plug and Drive, and Dav Savitkovich, the Chief Operating Officer of Plug and Drive. Please introduce us to Plug and Drive, Kara and Dev. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indu. This is Kara, and I'm really pleased to be here tonight um, and uh, hopefully help a new crowd of folks get on board with electric cars. Uh, Dav and I are going to sort of uh, divide and conquer tonight, so I'm going to take the first part of the presentation and then hand it over to her. 
so I'm going to talk sort of uh, the higher level, the, the what we call the business case for electric cars, just make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, and uh, we're going to sort of go through why EVs make sense from an environmental point of view as well as economic. And, and this slide really helps to set the context, which is, I mean, why do we even talk about pushing EVs? We heard from Rasha some of the reasons why Guelph is encouraging EV ownership. And the main reason, of course, is um, transportation is uh, the largest emitting, GHG emitting sector in Ontario. And uh, pretty much everywhere in Canada, it's number one or number two. Here in Ontario, it's number one. And so you really can't achieve your climate goals um, as a city or as a province or as a country without tackling transportation. And uh, so, so that's why we even begin to talk about electrification of transportation, both transit and uh, personal vehicles, as a really important part of any climate plan. And so uh, here you can see Ontario's uh, electricity get grid and this, and this is why EVs make so much sense here in Ontario, maybe more so than in some other places. Uh, Ontario's electricity grid is made up of uh, uh, mostly nuclear and hydro with a little bit of renewables and a little bit of natural gas. And so um, if you think about your electric vehicle, this is what you're plugging into. And most of us are gonna plug in our electric cars at night. And uh, uh, that's because that's when it's convenient, when we go home. And, uh, and that's gonna be almost entirely nuclear and hydro with a little bit of renewable energy, uh, wind in particular at night. Uh, natural gas uh, is the only fossil fuel left on Ontario's grid. We closed coal a few years back. And that, um, that natural gas only runs at the peak time. So, so typically you're plugging in at night, you're plugging into almost entirely emission-free electricity. And, and that's one of the reasons we really encourage EVs as well. Uh, on, this is all, all our electricity infrastructure is owned by the province. And so by plugging in to uh, electricity instead of gas, you're actually uh, providing that money straight to the province. Uh, we own these electricity resources, whereas when it comes to oil and gas, for the most part, that money leaves the province. So you're not only doing your province an environmental favor, but you're doing uh, them an economic favor by uh, switching to electricity. Next slide, please. So Rasha mentioned uh, that we had this ambitious goal of hitting 5% of new passenger car sales uh, by 2020, and uh, it, it's a great success story that Guelph has already gotten there. Um, actually, the entire province was incredibly close to achieving uh, 5% of new passenger car sales uh, in 20, uh, sort of partway through 20, 2018. Uh, unfortunately, when the uh, Ford government came in um, and canceled the incentives, uh, we lost a lot of ground in Ontario, and in fact, we're back down to more like 2% or less of new car sales annually right now. And of course, all car sales are down right now because of the uh, COVID crisis. But, um, but uh, we're optimistic that we can still get back to this uh, percentage. This was actually a goal set by the Liberal government uh, in around 2012. And um, it was seen as incredibly ambitious at the time. And it was quite a achievement that we almost got there. But uh, Plug and Drive does a lot of research around um, the barriers to, to people actually um, choosing electric cars. And if we were to boil them all down to uh, just two reasons, um, these barriers really can be summed up as knowledge and range anxiety. And so I'll just spend a minute on each. What we're finding in our research is that uh, unfortunately consumers uh, still don't really have the knowledge they need to understand those environmental and economic benefits in order to make the switch. And, you know, what we're finding is they don't know how much money they're going to save. They don't know um, uh, really what the environmental benefit is. They don't really know that there's lots of makes and models. They don't know necessarily that's going to be easy to do. And so these are the things that Plug and Drive really focuses on trying to help the consumer with all these knowledge bits so that they'll feel comfortable taking the next step. And then the, the number two issue is uh, range anxiety. 
And I'm sure you've heard about this range anxiety is that idea that you're going to be out driving somewhere and you're afraid that you might run out of fuel. I really believe that this issue is going away as an issue that uh, concerns people. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. First, there's a lot more charging stations out there than there used to be. We still do need some more, but it's getting a lot, lot better. And the other reason this issue is going away is, of course, the battery ranges of the cars is improving every year. So um, I don't think we'll be talking about range anxiety in a couple of years, but I think we're still a few years away from everybody having all the information they need to make uh, uh, the choice to switch to electric. And, and uh, events like this and um, Emerge does a lot of great events trying to educate the public and help them uh, make a more environmentally friendly choice. Next slide. Huh, that's right. I mean, I can keep on going, but just, <laughs> there we go, thank you. Uh, so these are some of the key messages that we try to help the public understand. Uh, we try to make sure everyone, and hopefully uh, the folks that are joining here, you're already interested in EVs, you probably already know a lot of these, but a lot of the general public does not. So, you know, on average, an individual is going to save about $2,000 a year on fuel and maintenance. That's because electricity is so much cheaper than gas. And also uh, EVs are a lot simpler. They have a lot fewer moving parts than gas cars. So, of course, the maintenance is a lot, lot less. Um, also, we talked about the environmental benefit. It's a, as much as a 90% emission reduction in comparison to a, a gas car. And that, again, that's because because um, it's not fossil fuel based, it's, it's uh, based on our electricity grid, which is almost GHG free. So uh, great environmental benefit. And then of course, lots of makes and models to choose from. A lot of people have heard about Tesla and maybe one other brand, but they don't realize there's more than 40 makes and models available. And then of course, um, most people, because they typically only commute 30 to 50 kilometers a day, are only really needing to charge their car about once a week. Uh, whereas people imagine this being a big hassle that they're going to be doing this all the time and we try to help them understand actually it's very convenient most of the time you're doing it at home and you're only doing it uh, on a once a week basis. So those sort of sum up our, our key messages and um, this is our beautiful electric vehicle discovery center. If you have not had the opportunity to go there, uh, I really encourage you to visit us when we open. Of course, we're not open right now, but we hope we'll be able to open in a socially distant way some point soon. Uh, if you haven't come, please do. I'm gonna pass this over to Dab to tell you more about our facility and some of our other activities. And then of course, I'm happy to take your questions a little bit later. Great, uh, thank you, Kara. And uh, I would like to extend my thanks to Emerge Guelph for really leading the charge on uh, EV adoption in Guelph. And uh, this seminar is certainly a step in the right direction. Some of you may have heard of the Electric Vehicle Discovery Center. This is Plug and Drive's way of leading the charge. It is actually the first facility of its kind in the world. So it's a world's first located right here in Ontario, uh, North Toronto. We opened uh, about three years ago, May 2017. So I think it's uh, about two weeks from now, we would be celebrating our third anniversary, uh, which, is, which is really a significant milestone. Um, and really the catalyst for developing the center was based on consumer feedback. And it's probably similar to some of the things you've experienced along your way, if you've been looking for an EV. Um, we did a secret shopper uh, survey uh, in, at dealerships to better understand what the shopping experience was like. And we also surveyed gas car owners to better understand what some of those um, barriers or myths were that still persist to this day. And what we found is that um, in terms of the supplies, it may be some of you have gone to a dealership and they don't have um, the car you're looking for and, and, and the salesperson might even have uh, encouraged you to consider a gas car, even though you went there looking for an EV. That was sort of a, 
an aha moment for us. And uh, so what we did is take all this learnings based on consumer experience and bundled it all into what we call a one-stop shop. So we work with a multitude of brands. Uh, you can get uh, test drive anything from an Audi to a Volvo. So anyone that's um, producing or manufacturing an EV at this time, we have them in our fleet um, to test drive at our center. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were open five days a week, Wednesday through Saturday. Um, and we're now kind of looking at what that new um, opening uh, might look like given the social distancing parameters, we all need to work with it. But um, we also, within the center, have a home charging station gallery, and we also have an online store. So um, one of the questions, or many of the questions we get are about home and public charging. I'm sure that's uh, not uncommon if you've ever thought about buying an EV. So we actually just take people through an educational journey to enable them to better understand EV ownership. Um, the people that work in the showroom are EV owners, so they're not um, sales staff. This is a very neutral, friendly family environment. In fact, you know, we, we like to joke the dwell time is, is, can be upwards of three hours. People spend an afternoon at the Discovery Center to learn about EVs. Uh, we learn about their lifestyle and we help them um, find the right EV for them, one that will fit their lifestyle. Um, it is an educational center, so we have a numerous interactive touch, touch screen displays that uh, a person can sort of calibrate uh, various things to, is sort of like a quiz to bet, enable them to better understand what EVs are all about. Um, and it was a very nice social atmosphere as well, uh, where people got to, to mingle and, uh, and share uh, stories about EV ownership. Um, in our first three years, we had over 20,000 visitors. Um, and of those visitors, what we also do is survey them. We survey them before a test drive, after a test drive. And then we also survey them after they've left the center to better understand our impact. So we, what we know is that six months after visiting the center, 33% actually went out and purchased an electric vehicle. So we like to, to um, feel like we give people the confidence to go out there and, 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 and move forward with that buying decision. And then the other 60% plan to do so, plan to purchase in one to two years. And then there's a small margin of people, 7%, that say um, an EV is not in their future. We, uh, um, again, pre-COVID, probably would have held a session like this in, in what we call Power Place. So we've, we're also a large scale event venue, can host events anywhere from 25 to 150 people. Uh, everything from executive board meetings to um, fundraisers for charities, workshops in the round table settings, or um, a training session, sales training. Um, and as well as that, we were able to bring in a large contingent of high school students, about 500 or so, um, in, over the last few years. And uh, it's been an excellent avenue um, to get the uh, youth involved in understanding electric vehicles. Again, going forward, we're hoping that um, one day events uh, in person will, will be something uh, we can move forward with. But for now, we have to do so virtually. And it's, it's having great impact as well, which I'll show you on a few later slides. So in terms of our model, you know, we think the recipe for success is attributable to four things. Um, one is the fact that it's a no pressure non-sales environment and you can find a make and model in a one-stop shop. So you might have gone in thinking you might perhaps wanted uh, an Audi and then you test drove a BMW and that might be the right vehicle for you. Of course, the experiential side um, is, is pr probably the one thing that um, can be lacking sometimes at a dealership if they don't have the car available. So the fact that we have them all readily available is certainly a, a unique value proposition for our consumers. Um, in terms of partnerships, uh, we work with a wide variety of partners. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. So 
Um, we work with a wide variety of partners in the electricity sector, in the auto sector, and in the charging station manufacturing sector um, to move this initiative forward. Um, <clears throat> events have always been a, a really um, nice um, ancillary source of revenue for us. Um, in addition to the events uh, at the center, we would do events, uh, what we call road shows, and, and those would take us to places such as Guelph. Uh, we've been there numerous times and worked with Emerge Guelph um, to really help that conversion that you saw to EV ownership. And really what uh, has struck us is uh, exciting is what we call the two-way referral through stakeholder engagement. Um, when we first embarked upon this, we were a little worried that the dealers might see us as competition and, and they were a little reluctant. If, 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 uh, if we were totally honest, uh, they thought that we might favor one dealer over another, which is entirely not the case. Um, what we do in terms of our data capture from our visitors is it's all based on a postal code and it's opted in permission based and then based on that postal code, the automaker refers to a dealer closest to that postal code and it's up to them to follow up. So in no way are we uh, in the sales process, but we are enabling sales um, by uh, lead referral to auto manufacturers, which they have obviously found to be very, very helpful. And this is uh, a list of our sponsors. Of course, none of this would be possible without them. Um, you can see the wide range of accelerator sponsors. So if you came to the center, you would be able to test drive any one of their brands, makes and models, and that's growing all the time. Uh, even in this environment, we have uh, one new um, sponsor um, coming on board. It's just a matter of um, getting the legal signed off, but uh, they're very much in favor uh, of coming on board. It's been three years in the works and uh, um, it's, it's a sign that uh, EVs are here to stay when new sponsors are coming on board. In terms of our partners, um, some new partners came on board last year, Clean Air Partnership and the Mike Brigham Foundation. Um, they were uh, very pivotal um, in helping us launch our used EV program. So they're the partners that we work to deliver the used EV program. Uh, what we, uh, Kara mentioned, um, that we were in a position uh, whereby the provincial incentive for EVs had uh, dissipated and uh, we started to look at what opportunities were out there in terms of, um, in light of the fact that the federal incentives, are, or sorry, the provincial incentives were gone, what might we do provincially to help um, accelerate EV adoption? And that's how the used EV incentive program was born. And it was funded through very generously through the Mike Brigham Foundation. And we worked with Clean Air Partnership on the delivery of programs. Um, so this has been um, another, you know, first. There's never been a private incentive in Canada. It was launched um, last April uh, when Kara and I were putting together what, you know, possible numbers might look like. Uh, we, I think we, um, we were thinking 100 would be good, 200 would be um, out of the ballpark. And um, within six months, we had already uh, issued 200 incentives. So we administered the incentive program. Um, so at that point, we went back to the funder and said, we've already reached our goal in, in six months. Um, can we top this up? So late last year, that was topped up and uh, we're now doubled that again. So we're at 400 incentives um, as of April. Um, we have, so what we do is deliver a seminar to, and pre-COVID it was in person. Um, we've delivered seminars to a thousand uh, participants and our conversion rate is 40%. So we've issued 400 incentives um, on a thousand participants which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and if, if we look at those 1,000 participants, uh, half of those were in the G, um, Toronto area, held at the center, we would have two seminars um, a month at, at the um, Discovery Center. 
and then the other 500 were throughout the province. And uh, I have to do, I have to uh, give a shout out to Guelph because uh, of the communities in around the province, Guelph had the highest number of participants um, in the seminars that it did. Um, it had nine, around 90. And just at uh, 4.30 today, I had another submission for Guelph for their um, rebate. So even up to this minute, they're coming in and they are um, converting at a rate of 40%. So they're right on average. So kudos to Guelph. If you're wondering how that compares, say to Ottawa, uh, Ottawa had 75 uh, participants and converted 21%. So Guelph is doing a phenomenal job um, as, as shown in um, the earlier statistics, but certainly in the USED V program, it's really accelerated and um, um, you're to be congratulated on, on helping um, move the USED V program forward. Um, in earlier this year, um, we decided to complement that program with a scrappage incentive program. So uh, ultimately the goal is to get the gas cars off the road. And so um, if you're in a position where your gas car uh, is one that um, you're ready to scrap, it can be donated through carheaven.ca. And once that's done, your incentive will be topped up another thousand dollars. So there is theoretically $2,000 available for used EV incentives. Uh, we're really uh, thrilled to see the progress um, in a short period of time. Uh, we have another uh, um, seminar scheduled for May 13th. Uh, we can send the link out uh, after this webinar for those people that might be interested. It, it goes much more in depth into EV ownership, uh, much more so than today. Today was sort of to whet your appetite and um, a more in-depth seminar will be taking place next week. And that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Kara and Zav. What you're doing at Plug and Drive, it's so remarkable. And actually, um, I wanna share the results of the poll that um, the attendees were um, doing in the waiting room. So it turns out 78% of the people attending tonight do not own an EV. So that was a lot of information and it's amazing. And on the note of EV ownership, um, I'd like to bring two Guelph women into our comfy chair chat, both of whom have joined us and brought their expertise to our EV shows as EV ambassadors. Shirley Hunt is a social worker with a community development background. She's always enjoyed bringing people together to brainstorm and launch new ideas. At Up and Running, she brings one of her favorite outdoor pastimes, trail running, to women who are looking to improve their mental health. Before that, Shirley founded and became the first executive director at Focus on Nature, a school-based program bringing children into nature. Shirley claims that she didn't know she was an EV expert until she volunteered as an EV ambassador. Welcome, Shirley. And Lisa McTaggart is a landscape architect operating her Guelph practice, Arium Design Group. She's also the senior landscape architect at the Office of Responsive Environments based in Toronto. There are three licensed drivers in Lisa's household sharing the EV, as well as a second gas vehicle. The EV is always the first to leave the garage and we'll have to ask her how well that family dynamic works. Her partner, Leo, is a car guy who now rarely drives his gas car, opting for the EV if he gets to it first. Welcome, Lisa. So um, I want to take this opportunity to have you both share your stories and maybe speak to what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome to buy your EV. You're on mute, Shirley. Lisa, if you guys want to unmute yourselves. Yes, thank you. Hi, can you hear me now? 
Okay. Uh, we bought our IV, EV uh, in 2018. We did the order in 2017 after visiting Plug and Drive in Toronto. Uh, we had an old VW Golf that was a bad diesel and we had to basically retire that car, trade that in. Um, so we, we knew we needed a new car and we knew we wanted to reduce our, our environmental footprint. So we looked into getting an EV. My biggest fear in getting an EV uh, was, well, they, I had a couple. Uh, I was definitely worried about the technology aspect of it. Um, wondering like, how do you drive these things? They look so complicated. Um, and is it going to take me a long time? I thought the learning curve would be very, very long and, and steep. Um, and I think I was a little bit worried about the range. I did have a little bit of that anxiety. Uh, and uh, with the particular EV we purchased, it's a Tesla 3, and we got on the list really early. We were lucky to get the incentive. Um, I was worried because it was rear wheel drive. That was all that was available. And I, I just remembered like rear wheel drive in the eighties and, and you would just get all over the road. And so I didn't realize that there's a difference with electric vehicles with rear wheel drive. So those were the three main things that I was a little bit worried about. How about you, Lisa? Where's Lisa? <laughs> um, can, Hi. and you can hear me. Um, I guess, the the I was driving a um, 2005 Dodge Grand Caravan minivan, and it was very old. Um, and I just had attended some of the emerge sessions about how how we can reduce our carbon footprint and our greenhouse gas emissions. And we were working on our house to make it more efficient. And I just thought, well, I'm tired of driving this great, big, boring um, minivan, mostly by myself. So it was way more vehicle um, than we needed. Um, and so I just looked on Auto Trader um, for electric vehicles. And I was really drawn, uh, I have a, a 2000, uh, 2015 Leaf and um i bought it, it nissan by nissan and it it's just a really funky looking little car it reminds me of a, a french mm -hmm. car and um so i actually was just looking for something really unique and um it was going to be my car um and there was one for sale in kitchener mm -hmm. um so I was Googling uh, Auto Trader on a Thursday and on a Saturday I was test driving this car and uh, we bought it. Um, the thing I like most about driving it um, is it's way less stressful to drive. And this is the su surprising thing for me um, is how much road noise and engine noise you get in um, in a in a internal combustion engine car, and how much that adds to the stress of the driving experience. And so, I just it it's you can have the radio way way more quiet. Um, and so I'll pull up to a light and I can actually hear everybody's conversations in the cars next to me because there's no noise around. And so the things like uh, range anxiety and learning how far the car can go, that's sort of less of an issue because most of the trips that we do, like I would say 95% of the trips we do are maybe to the grocery store, um, visit family, locally um, and if we have to go further we do tend to take the um, other car because um, it's it's bigger and holds all four of us because I have teenagers and it's just a little bit bigger. Thank you Lisa and thank you Shirley. Um, 
Kara and Dev, maybe I'll take it back to you. How do Lisa and Shirley's experiences compare with what you've seen with the thousands of EV curious people that you've worked with? Sure, and do I'll start and I'm sure Dav will have more too to chime in. Um, well, these are typical concerns, I would say. Um, and uh, it's interesting though, because of course, uh, there's sort of a funny uh, saying, a lot of EV owners say, uh, the only people who have range anxiety are the people who haven't got an EV yet. <laughs> because it's sort of a thing that people imagine will be a problem, but then once they actually have the car, they realize it really isn't a problem, but it's a real thing in their mind, you know, beforehand. And I think what we have found is that the one to two trips a year that might be far, like let's say every year you do some summer road trip or every year you once a year go to Montreal or whatever the once or twice a year thing is that you do, um, it looms very large for people, but then when they really think about it, like 95% of the time, all they're doing is going back and forth to the same two places to work and maybe to like in-laws or, you know, there's just very few places that they're going and they're pretty short distance. And so what we found is that when people really look at what they actually do, as opposed to what they think they might do, um, the EV can work for them. And of course, as I said, you know, as the battery ranges improve, this becomes even less of an issue because I've actually taken my EV uh, to New York City and I've driven to Lake Placid and I've driven to Windsor, I've driven to Quebec City, I've driven, I, you know, so it can all be done now. It's much, much easier than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but certainly I would say that uh, these are very common and it's great though to see people like sort of overcoming those issues and, and getting into one and realizing they totally can do it. Anything from you, Dove? Well, I would uh, concur with all of that. Uh, I think the experiences um, sort of mirror what we hear at the EV Discovery Center. Thrilled to hear that uh, you decided after a visit to the Discovery Center to purchase an EV. Um, I think uh, what's common is you'll find that once you've made that decision, waiting a year is, is also something people are willing to do. So once they've made their mind up EVs for them, uh, they'll go back to a dealer and, and put their deposit down and there is a willingness to wait. Um, so, so you share that in common with a lot of people. I think uh, as well, in term, as Kara said and others, um, in terms of the range anxiety with the battery uh, capacity and range extending um, increasingly year over year as new uh, models come out, um, it's going to be less of a concern, but it is a concern until you buy one. <laughs> um, but when we kind of uh, walk people through it by, by talking us through how they charge their phones, you know, um, and I, I guess when we all got a, a Back in the day, for me, it was a BlackBerry. You used to wonder if it was going to run out of charge, and you're always looking at the bars and and uh, wondering when you needed to recharge your phone. Is it's kind of the same behavioral experience with your car. At, at a certain point, you get to understand your car and its behavior, and 80% or more um, charge at home. Um, workplaces now is the second uh, charge point, and then uh, public charging is. Uh, for long distance or convenience charging, but but really um, most of your charging will be done at home. So good to, to hear those experiences. Thank you so much, um, Dev and uh, Kara. Um, I, I wanted to share the results of our second poll. Um, so just after um, some of this uh, webinar has been going on, 89% of our attendees are considering buying an EV, which is just great. So those are some good numbers. Mm -hmm. And speaking of our attendees, do we have, let's open up those questions from the audience. Um, have we had any questions? I know I saw the one about the Discovery Center and where it's located. So um, is there any other questions from the audience? Until we're accumulating those, I have a question on behalf of my daughter. So last summer, 
we actually um, went out and needed to buy a new vehicle, a second vehicle for our household because our schedules with two children just were all over the place. So we actually went to a dealership and we were not asked even once if we were considering looking at an EV. Mm. Why do you think that is, that EVs aren't given the importance? Um, maybe we can start with you, Shirley, there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one reason is because, um, and I think the, you know, the two founders of Plug and Drive can confirm this, but um, regular dealerships make a lot of money from maintenance and electric vehicles have extremely low um, requirements for maintenance. We, we have 35,000 kilometers on ours and nothing has required maintenance. There's very few moving parts. You don't have to take it in every 50,000 or anything. Um, so I think, I think that's part of it, that it's more appealing to sell gas cars because they break down more and they can make a lot of money from that, from the road. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I'll add. I'll add. I agree with you, Shirley. That is one of the issues for sure. Although we can never get a dealer to admit that's one of the issues, but we've definitely heard that. The other issue is really supply. Like um, what we found in our secret shopper is just uh, now that's a few years old now, but we find it's still the case that a lot of dealers just don't have any EVs and so of course they want to sell you something they have on the lot mm -hmm. and so you can think if you're a sales guy on the floor like you want to make a sale that's your job and so if there doesn't happen to be one you're going to try to sell what you've got and so one of the big issues that we have been advocating is we have to make sure that the cars are available because what we found is in the dealerships where they were available they tried a lot harder to sell them to you um, and so we know that that's one of the big issues. And so I would say it's, it's, it's that as well. And Lisa, you had something? Um, for, for in my case, um, in all of Auto Trader, the, the day that I decided to look, there were three Nissan Leafs for sale. Um, one was in uh, Belleville, one was in Ottawa, and one was in Kitchener and there just wasn't a lot of supply. And um, so there was no, no availability at a dealer to, to look at a used car. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I agree with Shirley, um, we have, I think we put new wipers on a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, and, and we had to buy uh, new uh, summer tires. Um, because the tires had worn out um, but that's it um, in terms of maintenance that's so, really good to know that the maintenance is that low like that's good news for us buyers oh for yeah. sure and actually um, it's actually dramatic because um, if you think about it uh, a gas car has about somewhere depending on make between 2,000 and 3,000 moving parts, and EVs have somewhere between 20 and 30 moving parts. And so just intuitively, you know, there's just so many fewer things to break. Uh, and that's sort of the main reason why EVs are so uh, cheap to maintain. There's just very little to do. I also had a Nissan Leaf as my first EV. I had a 2011 Nissan Leaf, which I sold in, in 2018. And uh, that car I'd had for six years, and in six years, I changed the wiper blades, $20. Wow. And so like, I wow. challenge you to find a car that you could possibly spend less on. And in fact, they never even called me in for any service or anything. Uh, there was just nothing for them to do. Now we know actually that they should have their brakes checked every now and then. But back then I was like a guinea pig, they didn't know. But, uh, but so it just goes to show that actually uh, we don't have a lot of data on maintenance yet, but as the data comes in, because you know the oldest EV is like nine years old, as the data comes in, we're going to see actually like really big savings from maintenance, uh, you know, year over year. Can, can I add one thing to that? Sure. Um, you were talking about brakes and brake pads. Well, one thing that happens with electric vehicles is you don't need to change the brake pads very often because you have, in many of the models, you have regenerative 
braking, which means you're releasing your accelerator and it's braking just by doing that. So that's the probably the most fun aspect of EVs for me. And it's what I discovered when I went to plug and drive. I drove around a Chevrolet Bolt and it was so much fun. It was like an extremely zippy golf cart. And I just went, this is crazy. And you get very quickly used to that release of the pedal and push the pedal down one, one pedal driving. Um, but because of that, you're not using your brakes very often. It's much, uh, much less wear and tear on your brakes. Thank you for that. And I see we have a whole bunch of questions from the audience. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll move on to the first one. What is the average battery life? Not capacity, the average battery life. So I guess that's years. Mm -hmm. So let's give that to Kara or Deb. Yeah, um, the battery life, um, it, there's a recent study actually that just came out that if you're into the, like really want to get into the details on that, there's a company called Fleet Karma, and they have a very detailed study that just came out where they're looking at the battery life. Um, and it looks like those batteries are lasting a lot longer than anybody thought they would. All the automakers have at least an eight year warranty on the battery, and some have 10. Mm -hmm. So you know that they're expecting the batteries to last at least that long. But what the studies are showing is that the batteries are likely to outlast the car. Um, so this isn't something as we hear that a lot in our used EV seminar, like, am I going to have to worry about this battery? And what we tell people is you can do a test on it, uh, to see, you know, how much life that battery has left in it, just to be sure. Uh, and also you might still have some warranty left, so that'll give you some comfort. But, um, the true answer to this question is, you know, we're only at year nine of, you know, the oldest EV. So that's all we have, you know, for, for data. So the true answer is like, what's the full battery life? Like we don't even know, but the, but that study from Fleet Karma shows us that it's looking good, that the batteries will last longer than the car. That's great. Um, next question was, how do you charge on a cross country trip? Have um, Lisa or Shirley, have you guys taken like a cross country trip or? You wanna go first, Lisa or? Sure, um, the f I don't really, don't, haven't done that, that yet. Uh, the furthest I've driven, the, my, my leaf is uh, into Toronto. Um, and um, I usually um, check um, for a, a charging station. I have a couple of different apps on my phone. Um, and so I will make a plan um, to, to have a, a stopover or to actually be going to park at a location um, where there is uh, charging available. And I have a couple of different apps on my phone so that I can use um, flow charging stations and uh, charge point charging stations. And um, so I just kind of make a plan. So, so, but most of the time I take public transit um, for longer trips now. And that's just part of, we have three drivers. So um, one driver can't um, take a car for, the, for a longer time um, because somebody else needs that car. Um, and, uh, I just, I just prefer to take the go train. <laughs> I do as well, especially into Toronto. <laughs> what about you, Shirley? Uh, yeah, so I haven't gone across the country yet. My son is doing grad school in the States, in the U.S., down in, uh, New Jersey State, uh, near New York City. So we've driven down there a lot in the car in the Tesla 3, and it is no problem getting long distances. Uh, one of the main reasons is the bonus of the Tesla is you can access the superchargers as well as all the other chargers. Um, so on the way down, if I plug in my son's address down in the US, um, Tesla, the navigational system, will navigate you to that address and take you to the chargers that you need to stop at on the way. Um, so we're really lucky we've got 500 kilometers on ours. Um, that's how far we can go, but it will stop on the way uh, when we need to stop. 
So it's always kind of an, an adventure because you never know where it's going to navigate you to. But we end up in these like really interesting little towns in Pennsylvania and things like that. And, and um, with Tesla superchargers, they're super fast charging. They're 800, some of them are 800 kilometers an hour to charge. Um, so we can charge in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So we'll just go in for a lunch and then we'll get back on our way. So it's been really no problem going that long distance. Thank you. And I see Karen Rathwell has raised her hand. Do you have a question, Karen? No? Okay. We can move on to the next question. Are there models that can pull a trailer? Um, maybe Kara or Dav, if you can take this one. Dav, are you going to answer that one? <laughs> I think she's muted. Maybe. Oh, she is muted. Yes, she is. Yeah. I can try. Um, so there, there are, um, there are some models that can pull a trailer. Um, there aren't a lot. Um, the Tesla can actually, and uh, the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid can pull a trailer. And my understanding is the Volvo XC90 can also do it. Um, and you know, there's a lot more sort of truck SUV style vehicles coming our way in the next short while so you're going to see more and more that can like the earlier vehicles were smaller um, but we're seeing more and more coming out perfect thank you uh next is the province considering a new incentive have you heard anything from the province i i can answer that care if you want um, unfortunately, no, not, not uh, with the current government in place. We don't foresee a provincial incentive coming into play. Um, the federal incentive, as you know, uh, was adopted last year and um, it's made an impact um, in terms of uh, increasing EV adoption, but certainly not to the point where it was when we had a provincial incentive and you only have to look at BC and Quebec to understand when you have both a provincial and federal, um, their EV adoption rates are through the roof. And, um, um, you know, try as we might, it, it just doesn't seem to be on the horizon at this point in time. Um, that's why we're looking at other creative solutions, for example, the private incentive for uh, used EVs. Um, we're also looking at um, exploring um, some financing options that could be made available to uh, potential EV owners because we also know that um, financing rates are actually higher uh, for uh, EV owners. Um, part of that is due to um, the fact that EVs are fairly new and their depreciated value is not well understood. So because they're not necessarily, we're, we're seeing an emergence of second generation EVs coming on the market now for used EVs, but uh, banks didn't really have the history to lean on in terms of determining value uh, of an EV. Um, so as more and more of that data comes available, there are opportunities and, and private funders that might come into play to uh, support a program that uh, to, uh, allows better uh, financing for electric vehicles. Thank you for that. Um... Can you explain the difference in charging plug types? Yeah, I, I can if you want. Sure. That was a great point, by the way, on financing, and I hope that we're going to succeed on that because it's a big challenge for EV owners. Um, so uh, your car comes with a cord set. If you buy an EV, your car will come with a cord set. That's what we call a 110 plug, which is like, a regular outlet, it, it plugs into any regular outlet at your house, like what you would plug your phone into. 
Um, and so all the cars are kind of equipped to charge on that 110 plug from the get-go. Many of us will install a, what we call a level two charger. Um, that one uh, is uh, basically the equivalent of like a dryer or a stove plug with 220, 240 plug. And uh, that one will charge your car a little bit more than twice as fast. And that's why many of us who have a 100% electric vehicle, um, many of us will uh, get the level two. Um, but if you, let's say you have a Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid or a Ford C-Max or some of these, you're fine on a 110 plug. You don't necessarily even need the level two charger. Um, and that, the wand uh, for those, both the level one and level two is all the same. So if you're thinking of an EV, every car has the same wand, the same plug. So it's all consistent except for Tesla. Tesla's is a little bit unique. Um, we sort of say they're like the Apple of, uh, of electric cars. They have, to have their own plug, but uh, all the rest are the same. So let's say you had a charger. It wouldn't matter if you got a different car. Like you, you'd still be able to use it. And even me, I've had a Leaf, then a Bolt, and now I have a Tesla Model 3. And I can still use the same level two charger that I've had since 2011. I just put a little adapter on it to make it work. So those are all the same. And then the next level of charger is the level three charger. You heard Shirley talk about the superchargers. Those are considered level three. So those are the quick chargers on the road. Those are typically, you would never have that at home. You'd see those at highway rest stops and, and the outlet plug looks different on those. And some of the plug-in hybrids do not come equipped with that because you wouldn't necessarily need to quick charge a, a plug-in hybrid. Uh, but m all, almost all the 100% electrics, they come with that. Uh, and so that you could charge on a, let's say a road trip. And that's what those, that's what those are. So hopefully that, hopefully that answered the question. Yes. Yes, Lisa? Um, we only got our level two charger installed in um, November. Uh, it came with the car and um, for two and a half, uh, for one and a half years, um, uh, we uh, just plugged our car into the outlet in the garage and trickle charged it. Um, so we would plug it after 7 p.m. when the uh, power rate uh, was less expensive and it would be fully charged in the morning. Um, we had to do a major uh, electrical upgrade because our house didn't have a large electrical service. Um, before we could get the level two. So we just didn't have any capacity in the panel to put uh, the 220 um, in. And so uh, apparently the uh, battery lasts longer if you trickle charge it. Um, and so we still plug the car in to a regular old outlet most charging times. The only time that we would use the uh, level two charger um, is if we've done a bunch of errands in the morning or someone's forgotten to part, plug the car in um, because they it needed to be plugged in um, and we were waiting for the, you know, it needed to be plugged in at four o'clock and um, no one remembered to go out after supper and actually plug it in. Um, so, uh, and you can't run a vacuum cleaner and charge your car at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, that's funny. Um, well, now, you know, a lot of the cars have an app, right? So that you could set the, you can plug it in when you get home and you can set it to, to charge later, right? So that way you wouldn't have to remember to go outside because I definitely would not remember to go outside later if I, if I had to do that. So. I'm pretty sure my car does have that function, but I actually haven't read the owner's manual. It definitely to see does. What, <laughs> it definitely see what does that button is. My 2011 Leaf had it. So I know your, yours does. So you should. There, you should there are three buttons on the dash that I haven't figured out yet. And I've been driving it for two years. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you, Karen. I saw that you were unable to unmute yourself, so I'm going to do that. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. No, I think the moments passed. I was, we were talking about long distance trips. And so that's why I wanted to pipe in. I've turned my video off because I'm having trouble with my stability of my internet. So it, it's a little clearer when 
Uh, I just have the audio on, but I, I should just perhaps say that after two weeks of owning my Tesla 3, I had to drive to Quebec to visit my daughter near Ottawa. And I was quite anxious about that first trip. Mm -hmm. And yet, as, um, as Shirley's already said, I have a Tesla 3, and so you punch in the address, and then it takes you uh, right through your... Uh, navigational uh, trip and tells you all the, where you have to stop to charge. So that was hugely helpful. And I know that happens on the apps too. And, and for me, a little bit is getting used to where the charging stations are because I have done the trickle charge, but at six kilometers an hour, you know, it would, it takes a long time to fill up to 500 kilometers. So in a pinch, that's very helpful and you can get yourself to a faster charger. And I have done that many times now, um, but learning about where the chargers are that are convenient when you are traveling en route, asking people is very helpful. I know I was tricked. I, I watch a lot of YouTube when I got my Tesla just to find out how it's going to manage in the winter, what to think about as far as holding as much charge as possible. And it told me about a parking garage in Ottawa that I could charge my car at, but because of the July 1st parade and everything else, it was just a nightmare to try and get my car charged. And I did have a lot of anxiety on that one particular day. But other than that, it's never been a problem. Uh, you know, you have to think, you have to plan your trips. That's the only thing. And the night before you go to bed, you have to think, what am I doing tomorrow? Oh yes, I may need to top up my charge. And that's really as hard as it gets, just as you do in a gas vehicle. You have to think, oh yeah, where am I going? Okay, I need gas. And so that is not a huge leap. And so, yeah, I could never go back now that I um, have enjoyed it so much. Somebody talked about how quiet it was. It, it's, it's astonishingly quiet. Mm -hmm. And you don't expect that when you're in a car anymore because you're just so used to it. But yeah, these, these cars are a wonderful invention. So I would highly encourage anybody that's listening to go out to learn about that test center is terrific. I, I just, I tried to drive a few, this was 2016. I knew I wanted an electric car when I could gather up the money and um, I couldn't drive any, I couldn't test drive one electric car before I had to make my mind up. And so I did buy the Tesla online, just ordered it like out of a catalog, which is <laughs> a big switch for me, but it has turned out to be great. And they really stand behind their product. Thank you for your insights, Karen. Um, can so I, can I just add, add one thing about uh, travel across Canada? Sure. So just, uh, the sign of the times that uh, Petrol Canada, uh, some of you may know this, is investing very heavily in um, EV charging at its uh, gas stations. So it's uh, they're doing it from west to east coast, uh, massive uh, EV charging infrastructure by Petrol Canada. So I think um, it's a sign of the times. Very soon it won't be an issue if you really want to make the trip from Guelph to BC. Um, I think there's ways to do it, as you say, plan your trip. I do know a colleague of mine who has driven to Vancouver uh, on numerous, countless occasions. He's in Toronto and he uh, takes the route right now through the US. So he'll go south and then west and has had no issue um, getting to BC from, from uh, Toronto area. Thank you, Dov. Mm -hmm. um, some more poll results. I find these are so interesting. If you are going to buy an EV, when are you expecting to buy? Within six months, 14% of the attendees. Six to 12 months was 36%, and 12 to 24 months was 50%. So that's an interesting fact. And I had another one here. Sorry, just bear with me. <laughs> Um, if you are deciding to buy an EV, will it be a new or used? New, 20%, used, 40%, and doesn't matter, 40%. 
So one of the questions relates to this. Um, is there a difference in car insurance for EVs? Mm. Uh, I know Lisa has um, both a gas and a EV. So maybe we can start with you, Lisa. Um, our 2004 Acura Integra, the insurance is um, quite a bit less on that uh, compared to the 2015 leaf um but to add my son as a, a a new younger driver um the insurance on the leaf is um significantly less to add him as an occasional driver than it is to add him to the acura um so uh it, it was a slight increase in the cost of insurance, but we went from a 2005 to add to uh, 2015 um, car. So it was a little bit, a little bit more, but I, I don't, they just rated it the same as they would uh, a small car um, of that size. Um, the, uh, they didn't recognize the um, torque on the car. So the Acura Integra is considered a, a performance car, sports car. Um, but the Leaf was just put in the same as any other other type of car. Um, so it, it wasn't a huge difference for us. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that insight. I, I could add a bit there, um, Estelle. Sure. Yes. Uh, so there are some insurance companies that actually offer discounts specifically if you're buying a green car. Uh, one of those insurance uh, companies is TD. They will offer 5% toward off your premiums if you purchase an electric vehicle. So I would look out for companies um, that are dedicated to the EV or greening of vehicles and they're offering special discounts because they actually know EV clientele, um, highly educated, um, they are safe drivers um, and are good clients to, to bring on board. So um, I would explore options because the discounts are out there. Thank you, Doug. And in moving with that, um, so when an EV is totaled after a collision, what's the environmental impact? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, you know, the, the one thing I can say is, of course, the, the, the people often ask, that's probably where this question is coming from, like what happens to the battery at the end of life? Because other than the battery, it's like the main difference, right? So that's something that the gas car doesn't have. And um, we're actually finding that um, these batteries are typically, uh, I mean, depends on, I guess, how badly it's damaged, but typically they're being refurbished and reused. Um, uh, either as backup storage, like at a building or uh, for a charging station, and then they are fully recyclable. So there are companies right here in Canada that were already recycling cell phone batteries and um, laptop batteries that are, you know, not hugely different from the, the EV battery there, lithium ion batteries. And so we expect them to be fully recycled in the end of life after usually a secondary use. So there isn't sort of a big waste problem, at least that we know of yet. And then the other related question we often get is, you know, is it more energy intensive, you know, to make an EV than to make a gas car because you have to consider the battery and all that. And it is more energy intensive to make an EV, but the GHG emissions, like the life cycle emissions are so much lower in an EV because most of the emissions come from the driving, not from the making. And so sort of a related point, just that despite this extra energy intensity, um, EVs are still much, much better for the environment. Thank you, Kara. Um, another poll result. What is your biggest barrier when it comes to buying an EV? Range, how long can I drive on a charge? 6%. Find that as the biggest barrier. Finding somewhere to charge, 
28%. And I think um, you all have answered that question very well. I was put at ease um, that I will be able to find a place to charge my vehicle, whether it's in downtown Toronto or whether it's in the States. Um, battery launch battery life how long the battery lasts 11 percent find that as a barrier and 83 percent find price as the barrier can you speak to the price i know you've spoken about incentives um but are they really that much more expensive than a gas car i can uh, tackle that one Thank you, Deb. So, so the um, price re remains the predominant barrier. Uh, we uh, surveyed a thousand gas car owners in 2016. At that time, price was deemed uh, the major barrier. At that time, there was a $14,000 incentive in place, and what we found was only 5% of the population actually knew that incentive was there. So then it was our job to start promoting the incentive and as we did that um ev uptake increased 120 percent from um 17 to 18 and when we opened the center it, it is proof principle that at this early stage of adoption that the incentives are really critical in fact you know incentives should probably be in place until we get to that five percent market share so having said that, I mean, you're not, you're in good company. Price uh, remains um, in, in a person's mind, the barrier. Uh, we did a recent survey actually after the Toronto Auto Show and it was the same, price remains the barrier. So what are the facts? The, the average price gap is about $10,000. If you're comparing a, a similar gas car to um, an electric vehicle. So the federal incentive really cuts that in half. If you get if you get the five thousand dollar rebates, so it's really a five thousand dollar differential, um, and, and and looking at the cost savings that you achieve through maintenance and not buying fuel, you probably spend maybe thirty dollars a month on electricity, if that, a dollar a day. Um, you can make that up if if the average savings um, are twenty five hundred dollars, you can make up that gap in two years, and then you're you know you're you're at your break even. So you have to think of the um, total cost of ownership, um, sort of that break even point. And, and we find that the early adopters really have done the math. They recognize the economics of it. It does make great economic sense. You just gotta maybe put up a little bit more upfront at this point in time. Price will come down as more EVs come on market, um, demand increases, um, but at this point, you can recover very, very early on, within two years, that, that last $5,000. Thank you, Deb. And on, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Um, the way um, we got over the, the, the price uh, barrier um, was buying a used car. Um, the price yeah. was significantly right. less. And, yeah. um, and uh, it, it made it, I probably spent about the same as I would have spent buying another kind of car. Um, so it, it, you know, maybe it was a little bit more, I, I, maybe I could have found a slightly cheaper car, um, but our hydro bill only went up about uh, $8 a month um, wow. because we also happened to switch all the light bulbs in the house to LEDs the same month as we got the car. Um, yeah. So, it, we couldn't really tell what this, the difference in savings was, but um, at the time uh, I was filling up the Dodge Grand Caravan about one and a half times, about three times every two months because I really don't drive a lot. And um, that was at least 70 bucks a fill up. Yeah. And hand in hand, thank you, Lisa, for that. And hand in hand, um, going with the price is models. I think people aren't aware, first of all, of the used um, car vehicles being available and people aren't aware of different models. So last question that we're gonna take for tonight. Um, so people that have say three kids in car seats and under five years old, 
are there models that work for them? Yeah, that's really challenging and do it's Kara. Um, yeah, uh, we, we hear this quite a bit. Um, there is the um, Pacifica minivan, which is a plug-in hybrid. Uh, that one can fit it, uh, fit. And then of course the Tesla X, which is a super expensive one, but it can also fit three car seats. Um, you know, you probably won't have the, you know, the, the kids don't stay in car seats forever. That's what I can say, you know, being someone now who has older kids, you know, where that issue does go away. But um, it, it's, it is a challenge if you're in that stage of life where you have to fit the three across. We used to joke when we had the leaf and uh, I had one in a booster and one in a, in a seat. And so if someone wanted to bring a friend, I said, well, it has to be a really skinny friend. <laughs> because we only had the tiniest space between the two car seats. So, uh, but you know, those days ended and the kids got out of their seats and then it was fine. Uh, so uh, if it's a second car for you, then, you know, you don't have to worry so much about this issue. You can use the other car for carpooling. Uh, but uh, if it's your only car, then yeah, you might want to either go with the minivan or wait. Thank you, Kara. And on that note, I'd like to reiterate that Kara will be hosting an EV 101 used car seminar next week. You can find more information from the Emerge or Plug and Drive websites. A big thank you to all of our Comfy Chair chat speakers tonight. You've helped break the ice for all of us EV curious women. And the last slide. And there's another poll there. Um, a big shout out and thank you to our friends at Plug and Drive and our sponsor, Barry Cullen Chevrolet and Plug and Drive. Thank you, Kara, Dav, Shirley, Lisa, and everyone for attending. I'm Indu Aurora, and from all of us at Emerge, good night and stay safe. Thank, thank you. Thank you very so much. much. Thank you, Emerge. Sorry. Come visit us at the Discovery Center one day. <laughs> yeah, please. For sure. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs> That's pretty good.